Welcome to the services of Glendale Presbyterian Church, located at 9218 State Highway 83 North in Defuniac Springs, Florida. Sunday school is at 9.30 a.m. with Sunday services at 11 a.m. Wednesday night services are the first and third Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. If you would, go ahead and be turning in your scripture this morning. We're in uh, Luke chapter 5. If you're using your church Bible, page 1023. Page 1023 in your church Bible, Luke chapter 5. It's okay. Hey, it's okay. Woke some people up. It's a good thing. Last weekend, uh, Josh and Lynn and myself, we attended the Presbytery meeting down in DeBerry, Florida. And uh, one of the special guests at that, uh, those meetings was a man named Dean Weaver. Uh, Dean is the stated clerk for our uh, denomination. Dean lives up near uh, Pittsburgh, but he wanted to attend our presbytery and just give us an update on what the Lord is doing throughout churches in our denomination. And one of the things he shared was one of the priorities of churches in the EPC, and that should be getting the gospel out to a world that is in darkness. And he kept using this phrase that uh, stuck with me in light of what he was sharing. And what he said was, is that in our churches across the country, and even in our, especially in our churches along the uh, presbytery that we're part of, all of Florida and the Caribbean, he said those churches need to make sure they put the E back in the EPC. You see, we are the evangelical Presbyterian church. And the word evangelical means we're a church committed to get the gospel out to others, to share the good news. That as we consider the Great Commission, we realize it wasn't a suggestion that the Lord made to the disciples and to the church. It was a mandate. The gospel should be in our DNA. And so this morning, I want us to consider that as a challenge, not only to get the E back in our denomination, but also to get the E back here at our church at Glendale. And one of the best ways to do that is to put the E back into our lives, my life and your life. As we consider God's calling on our life, that he left us here for a mission. He could have taken us right to heaven when he saved us, but he gave us a mission. And that mission is ours until that day when he takes us home and we join that throne, uh, that throng of people around the throne, people from every tribe and nation and tongue. Last Sunday, we finished up our study in first Peter and I wasn't sure where we're going to uh, go next. And the more I thought about it and prayed about it, I really sensed that it would be good for us this summer to sort of look at Peter's backstory to sort of see what happened with him early in his life that caused him to become the leader he did among the other disciples and to cause him to become a leader in the early church? Because it didn't happen overnight. Uh, from the very beginning, Peter was a little rough around the edges. Maybe I should rephrase that. From the very beginning, 
Peter was a lot rough around the edges. And yet, the Lord kept dealing with him. And Peter became, as you know, one of Jesus' closest friends. He became one of Jesus' followers. And for three years, Jesus invested in him. And he had several divine appointments for Peter in order to build him into that leader he was going to become. And so this summer, we'll be looking at several of those things and see that the Lord wanted to put the E back in Peter's life. We'll see that this morning as we visit one of the first encounters that Peter had with Jesus. And that takes place in Luke chapter 5. And as we look at Peter's life this summer, I think we're gonna, we should be seeing a little bit of ourselves and where we are. And how God, just like he put a calling on Peter's life, God has put a calling on our life to serve. So with that in mind, Luke chapter 5 Beginning in verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing on him, pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked them to put, a, put it out a little bit from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, uh, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done that, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And may God add his blessing this morning to the reading and understanding of his word. Would you pray once again with me, please? Father, thank you that we have a, a word from you, a, a word that is living and active, a word that has been preserved through the centuries without error, a word that is very relevant to our lives today and where we are. So, Father, may your same spirit who inspired Luke to write these words, may that same spirit make them very uh, real to where we are. Speak to us through your word and give us ears to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Luke's account of this, and other gospel writers bring in some of the other details, but in Luke's account, Luke says Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee on the shore, and he comes upon these fishermen who are there sitting on the beach cleaning their nets. And Luke said the crowd got so big they began pressing in on Jesus. They, they had come, Luke says, to hear the word of God. But obviously there was also some in the crowd who were looking for a miracle. And so uh, Jesus begins uh, speaking to them. And they're sitting, listening. Not only was the crowd of people, but there's the four fishermen. Peter, his brother Andrew, and James, and his brother John. These four fishermen had been all, out all night, the night before. And they had come up empty. And so here they sit on the beach, 
and they are uh, tired and frustrated. They have red eyes and they have empty nets. And Jesus comes along and he begins speaking and the crowd gets so big, Luke says, that Jesus wants to get into Peter's boat and he pushed it out a little bit and Peter's boat became a pulpit for Jesus to speak from. Where people in the crowds could hear him better and see him better. And then after he finishes speaking to the crowd, Jesus speaks to Peter. And he says to Peter, let's, let's go fishing. Take me out to the deep waters and let's go fishing. Now you understand, as Peter's sitting there, he may have just gotten the last piece of seaweed out of his net. He may have just finished washing the last bit of salt water off of their fishing equipment. And so when the Lord says that, his response could have been what our response could have been. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> no, I don't want to go fishing anymore. I just want to go home and go to bed. I mean, besides, Lord, look at our baskets. They're empty. And on top of all that, this is the worst time of the day for fishing. But Peter responds, But Lord, because you say so, we'll give a shot. And so Peter, after having a front row seat all day long at Jesus' church by the seaside, they climb into the boat with Jesus and they take off to the place. And before the day's over, Jesus is going to put a calling on Peter's life and on the rest of those fishermen. And he's going to call them to serve, just like he calls us to serve. And as we consider this morning his calling on our life, I want us to think about three things that he promises to those who respond to his call. And the first of those is this, is the promise of a companion. A companion. Jesus said to them, when it was all said and done, come and follow me. Come and join me. Walk with me. Don't you enjoy having a companion with you when you do different things? Sure we do. Young and old alike. A week from tomorrow, when those 160 plus kids arrive at camp for their first week of camp, the chances of those little ones, second and third graders, not getting homesick, largely depends upon if they have somebody to share their experiences with. If they brought a friend with them, or if they make a friend at camp, but if they are all by themselves, we're going to lose some of them, and we do every year. We enjoy doing things with other people. You probably can think of things that you enjoy doing that is so much more fun when you have somebody with you. I love playing golf. Jim Bailey and I, we used to hit the golf courses at... Uh, uh, Mossy Head and Enterprise, Alabama. And we had a great time. Now a lot of our time we were in the woods looking for our balls. <laughs> but Jim and I had a great time those years of just being together and, and talking and sharing together. And I gotta tell you, golf is not near as fun to me anymore when I have to do it by myself. I just enjoy being with somebody else. And as Jesus called these disciples to himself, he promised them a companion. He said to them, come follow me, come be with me. And that was very important to them. In fact, it was so important, three years later, 
when he's with them in the upper room and he's telling them that he's soon going to depart from them, this is what he says to them. Hey guys, after I leave, I'm going to send another companion. The Holy Spirit's coming. And he will be with you. But on that day, there in that boat, at the beginning of Peter's journey, the thing he needed most was to come to grips with who Jesus was. The first thing he needed to come to grips with was the fact that he had just listened to Jesus speak all day and he realized this man is a uh, conduit. He is a, uh, a conveyor of God's truth. But Jesus wanted to reveal himself more to Peter and those other disciples. He wanted to pull the curtain back just a little bit more. And so he takes them on this fishing trip, and one of the first things that he reveals to these guys on this fishing trip is his omniscience. Meaning, he knows everything there is to know. And they knew that, they could see that, because he knew right where the fish were. You know, I, I really enjoy fishing, and I, I've been with people, and they have all kinds of strategies for the best way to fish. Some keep a close eye on the weather, and if it's not the right weather, it's just no use going fishing. And some uh, like to fish around structure in the water, because that's where the fish hang out, under the structure. And others will tell you, you just got to have the right kind of bait. If you know what kind of lure to use, then you'll really be able to find the fish. And a few years ago, I was with these guys out in the boat fishing, and they were using sonar to find where the fish were. And I know that's okay for some people. It wasn't for me. I was just like, no, I don't want to. I don't want to do that anymore. I'd rather find the fish some other way than see little things on the screen and say, there they are. <laughs> that just wasn't me. But Peter and those other guys had Jesus in the boat with them, and he was better than sonar. Jesus said to them, look, drop your nets right here. He knew exactly where the fish were. And that shouldn't surprise us, because he knows everything. He knows when a, a single sparrow falls to the ground. He knows how many hairs are on your head. And he has more to keep up with you of some than others. He knows all those things. He knows every star in the sky. Not only does he know every star, we read in the scriptures that he's named everyone. He knows everyone by name. He knows how many grains of sand are at Destin Beach. He knows everything. And Peter began to see him as the one who knows all. In fact, later, Jesus is going to tell Peter where to find a certain fish that had a coin in his mouth. And as we think about him as the all-knowing one, and the one who has a calling on our life, it begins with an understanding of who it is with us in the boat, in our boat, that wants to be our companion as we make our journey through this life. And he's one who knows you better than anyone, and he still wants you in the boat with him. Peter found out Jesus was omniscient, but also he sees him as one who's omnipotent, who is all-powerful. You see, not only did Jesus direct Peter to go to the spot where the fish were, I believe Jesus also called those fish to come to that spot. Because he's the creator. In fact, all through the Old Testament, people like Nehemiah and one of the psalmists says, uh, the Lord created the seas and all that is in them. 
And so when Peter and Andrew tugged on their net and they saw the kind of fish, the amount of fish that were in them, it says they had to call in the second boat. And even after they loaded up the second boat, it was so many fish that both boats began to sink. They saw firsthand the almighty power of the one who was with them. And Luke says at once, Jesus, uh, Peter falls down at Jesus' feet. And he begins to worship. He sees his holiness. Peter understood, not only does this one know the depth of the lake, he also knows what's in the depths of my heart. And as he senses who it is with him in the boat, it says he's overwhelmed with his own sinfulness. And he says to Jesus, depart from me, for I am a, I am a sinful man. He begs Jesus to leave him. You know why sinners don't like coming to church? Now some will tell you it's because of the hypocrites in the church. Or it's because Sunday's the only day they get to sleep in or go to the lake or go to the golf course. But a lot of times they don't like coming for, uh, to go to church because it's the same reason Peter begged Jesus to leave him alone. Because being around the Lord and being around the Lord's people is uncomfortable for them. That cross behind me is not only a sign of hope, it's a sign of guilt. And when Peter saw Jesus for who he really was, Peter also saw himself for who he really was. Same experience as Isaiah the prophet that we had in our responsive reading. That when the prophet saw that vision of the Lord high and lifted up and the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. One of the first things that come out of Isaiah's mouth is, man, woe is me. I am a sinful man. And if I'm speaking to someone this morning and you've never really grasped Embraced who Jesus is. That he is one who offers purpose and meaning for our lives. One who will guide us as our companion through troubled waters. I encourage you to consider him and turning your life to him. And as you get to know him better, like Peter, you'll see him as a source of God's truth. You'll see him as the one who knows all there is to know. The one who is all powerful. Nothing, absolutely nothing is too difficult for him. And just as Peter discovered, you'll see him as a God of mercy. Because he didn't leave when Peter told him to leave. He stayed with Peter. He forgave Peter. Well, not only did Peter and those others embrace him as their companion, but there was a second promise, and it was a promise of a change. You remember Jesus' response to them? Matthew records it word for word in his account when Matthew says, as they got out of the boat, Jesus says to those four men, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you. He's the one that needs to do the change. He's the one that changes Peter's heart. It's not that we need to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to get my act together and then I'll come and follow you. No, 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 that'll never happen. He's the one who does the changing. And that transformation has to occur from the inside out. The Lord has to bring about that change. And there are some Christians who use the excuse that, uh, man, I don't serve the Lord because I just don't have what it takes. I mean, I'll come every Sunday or every so often, 
and I'll sit here and I'll take up space. But I'll leave the work of the church to the professionals, to the pastor and to the officers of the church. And yet, when the Lord was dealing with Peter and called Peter to follow him, Peter was a mess. We'll find more about that out in weeks to come. And how about James and John? Not just Peter. James and John, these other fishermen, they were hotheads. They were the guys who told Jesus one time, Hey, Jesus, can you call fire down from heaven to burn that village that wasn't nice to us? <laughs> they inherited the nickname Sons of Thunder. You see, responding to the Lord's call in your life doesn't mean you have to clean up your act before he'll say, okay, come on. The Lord does that. All he says to us is this, follow me and I will make you. I'll make you into what I want you to be. So his calling in our life involves companionship. It involves uh, a change that he wants to bring and one more thing he promises a cause follow me and I'll make you what <laughs> fishers of men some people say you know what I, I don't want to follow Jesus because I have to give up too much of things that I love and what I want you to see is he's not pulling those guys away from something they love they love fishing. That was their life. But rather, he's going to take their love for fishing and their skills and experience in fishing and use those as they go out to serve others. And whatever it is you love doing, whatever it is you're gifted in, it may be that very thing that God wants to use in your life to be a service to others. If you're a stay-at-home mom, it could be that he wants to use you to mold those little ones that he's placed in your care. If God has gifted you musically, and we saw this morning how we missed those who are gifted in the area of music. And if you're gifted musically, God may want to use you in those areas, those gifts, to help someone. Some of you are teachers, have a great mission field of opportunities before you. And others are gifted in things like sports or baking or sewing, whatever it might be. God has given you different gifts and different interests and different passions, and he wants you to use those to be a blessing to others. You see, that term fishers of men may throw some of you for a loop because you don't like fishing. <laughs> Probably someone here, you, you don't even like the smell of fish. But you know the only time that term is used throughout the New Testament is when Jesus was speaking to fishermen. And he wanted them to use their experiences, their love, their gifts to serve him in the lives of others. And that's exactly what he's called us to do. To use whatever he's placed in your hand, right in front of you. Use those things to make a difference. He wants to put the E back into our lives. And Peter got it that day. He got it. Because when they got back to shore, Peter could have said this. You know, Lord, man, this is great. This haul of fish. Look, I'm going to make you a deal, Lord. I tell you what. I'll cut you in on our business. We'll do a 50-50 split. You'll get 50% of my business. All you got to do is show up once a week <laughs> and show me where to fish. But that's not what Peter did. Peter saw there was a cause much bigger than the fishing business. 
from now on, the Lord wanted him to be catching men. To becoming, putting that E in his life. Reaching out and being a, a blessing to others. And Peter got it. And so we read in this passage that from that day forward, they left everything behind. They walked away and began following Jesus. The Lord could have used other means of getting the gospel out. He could have wrote John 3.16 in the sky with fire if he'd have wanted to. But he chooses to use you and me to be the bearer of good news to others. How did that turn out for Peter? Well, one example was on the day of Pentecost. Peter preached a sermon. 5,000 people came to know the Lord. That's quite a catch. 5,000 people. Don't just take up space. Don't just spend your life away, but rather invest it. Rather make a difference. This past week I was reading about a man who's probably the greatest basketball coach ever. His name is John Wooden. John Wooden coached UCLA, and they won 10 NCAA basketball championships under his leadership. No other team has ever touched that. In fact, I think the closest anybody came was uh, five. Ten championships. He won 88 straight games from 1971 to 1974. No other men's basketball team has ever come close to that. John Wooden knew a lot about what it means to lead and what it means to follow. And this is what he wrote about that. He said, there's only one kind of life that truly wins. And that is one that places faith in the hands of the Savior. Until that is done, he said, we are, we are on an aimless course that runs in circles and goes nowhere. So as we look ahead to this summer and all that God has for us, God doesn't want us to be running on an aimless course, to, to run around in circles. He wants to provide purpose and direction for our life. And so he provides a companion. And he says, hey, get on board with me. Come and join me in what I'm doing. Follow me. And he promises... Not only a companion, he promises change. He says, you do that and I will make you into what I want you to be. And not only that, he promises a cause. Invest your life. Answer his call in your life to serve him. So Glendale Church, let's put the E back into our lives for his glory. Pray with me, please. <clears throat> Father, thank you for allowing us to hear and see that uh, the adventures of that day, as Jesus took those men fishing, what an amazing time that must have been. Father, I pray that as your people, you will help us to answer the call you put on our life to serve others. Help us to take the Great Commission seriously. You have blessed us with many, many gifts and interests. And I pray, Father, that we will seek to invest our lives in the lives of others for your honor and glory. Give us the strength to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.